Good morning, good morning, good morning. You are all so welcome to our Zero Conference 2018. Um, it's fantastic to have those of you who are returning come back to our home in the UN in Vienna. And for those of you who are here for the first time, you are very, very, very welcome. So yeah, let's just give us a clap. We're all here. Now, I also want to send love out to the people in the snow because it's freezing cold, and, um, but I'm really sorry we have to start because we have a very packed agenda. So I'm not being rude, but we have to begin. And so for those of you who do not know me, I'm going to be the difficult person in your life for the next three days. <laughs> yes, so my name is Caroline Casey. Um, I'm from Dublin, Ireland. I have the great honor since the beginning of the Zero Project to be asked to moderate this event, which is now three days, which began as a one day event. And my job is to keep us on time, um, to keep us doing the right thing, to inform you. I'm here if you need absolutely anything. Just so you know, I've been asked to explain this because I haven't done it many years. I myself am registered blind, so will you please come up and tap me on the shoulder or say your name because I won't see you. Um, I am passionate about this conference for very many reasons. I'm a social entrepreneur in the area of disability, business, leadership, inclusion. I also want to recognize hugely the support of Martin Essel and uh, the Zero Project in a global campaign. In a global campaign that we launched this year, which reached 810 million people, and I could not have done that without Martin. So I just want to say I love being part of this community. And this is what the Zero Project Conference is all about. This is one of my most favorite communities that I belong to, and we belong to many. And this community now stretches over 4,000 people worldwide which is incredible, from 180 countries. And what makes our community very, very special is nobody is more important than anyone else. You are not defined here by your job title, your role, your achievements, you're here equally. Every single one of us has something equal to contribute. And the thing that makes Zero such a great community to be in is not even what we hear in our plenaries or in the breakout groups, but the conversations that happen in the corridors. Here, please do not see somebody standing by themselves. They would like to have a conversation because this is the zero magic. So much collaboration has happened over the 10 years the Zero Project has been happening, seven years since the conference and five years since the UN. So please make sure that you talk to each other, laugh with each other, ask each other questions, because that's the pearl of collaboration. Remember, collectively, together, we are stronger and we make an unstoppable noise that will never be ignored. And we need to continue to build on that year in, year out. Five years ago, when we came to the UN, we were saying, wouldn't it be incredible in 10 years if we couldn't fit everybody in this room? Well, we've already maxed capacity. And I think that's a... We can't fit any more people in here. So I don't know where we're going to go next year. But I just want you to know that is every year we see the strength and growth, and that is down to all of you coming from all around the world to celebrate our unique difference and ability. Now, before we begin, I just want to, I refer to the importance of community. And it's very hard to start a conference like this with sad news, but it's, we're gonna do something both sad in recognition of the passing of two very important members of our community in the last year. And I ask us to have a moment's silence, if that would be all right with you, in memory and respect, sorry, for Neto Rotman from Israel, who tragically died over the weekend and her colleagues are here from Access Israel, they still have come because this is what Netta would have wanted. 
Yeah. And the passing of Singarat Atana Yake from Sri Lanka, whose wife will be here to pick up his policy award at tomorrow's award ceremony. So I just ask us to have a moment's silence in love and respect to two of our community members. All of us have lost people that we love, and many actually in the last year. And the passing of somebody we love is incredibly painful. But in talking to the guys from Access Israel, I think Michal had a great point to make. Not only should we show respect by silence, but I'm asking us to recognize the huge work both of those two colleagues made to our world, to celebrate the change they made happen, and the impact they had on us. And I would like us to give a robust round of applause for the value and worth of their lives. So please, a round of applause for our colleagues. <laughs> See, that's the zero applause. <laughs> um, as you can hear, my voice is going, so you probably won't have me shouting at you as much as I generally do. Um, but I also want to introduce you to a few things. Here is our great interpreting team over here. We have eight interpreters this year. Please a round of applause for our guys over here. And the most important question that I have been asked since those of you have arrived is the situation with the sandwiches. Okay, so in your bags, okay, I'm gonna answer this because food is always very important for all of us. You have three vouchers for sandwiches. That's one voucher per day. If you do all three today, you won't have any food tomorrow, okay? So we need to remember one voucher a day and after 11.30, that's 11.30, you can pick up your sandwiches in all the different boots on the two floors, okay? It's a bit different this year, but I'm also telling you <clears throat> Dinner is early. It's 5.30 this year. Great. So now to begin. 2018. I think this is going to be a big year. We often talk about the tipping point at zero. And I think this is the year. So how are we going to make the most of it? <coughs> the Sustainable Development Goals where no one is to be left behind is a hand on our back. Let's use it. Let's work with each other to ensure this is the year when we see big change happen. Now, as I'm losing my voice, I am going to ask our inspiration, our founder, our extraordinary friend, Martin Essel, to open the conference. Thank you, Caroline. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear partners, friends, and members of the Worldwide Zero Project, welcome in Vienna. I'm so happy that you are here and you are able to join us here in uh, Vienna today. This year, I think, there are delegates from more than 70 countries. That should be a new record. I recognize so many of you, and it's so wonderful that you are here. And it matters so much for both, for me and for my team. And for us, after another year of intensive work, it's really time to start. The Zero Project Network continues to grow. It is today. Uh, we have 4,000 experts around 180 countries. I think we can truly describe this as a worldwide community. What unites us all? We have one common target, and it is to support the goal of the UN CRPD. And we want to help create a world with zero barriers for all persons with disabilities 
and we do not want anyone to be left behind. And that is why the Zero Project finds and shares innovative practices and policies to improve the daily lives of all persons with disabilities around the world. This year, we are celebrating two important anniversaries. First, it is the fifth year running that the United Nations office here in Vienna has so kindly hosted the Zero Project conference. And second, the initial concept of the Zero Project is now 10 years old. Yes, we actually formulated it not long after the UN CRPD came into force. We want to say thank you all, not only for being part of the Global Zero Project Network, but also for your continuing and sustaining support. And since we want to celebrate this two anniversaries together with you, we have prepared also two memorable highlights which should touch our hearts. Tomorrow we will donate an accessible artwork to the United Nations office here in Vienna. And we will give the first performance of the Zero Project time. This year, our topic is accessibility. We have received so many outstanding innovations from all over the world, and we have presented the most innovative and scalable ones in our report. And almost all of these uh, 83 innovators have come personally to Vienna to present to you their new and successful approaches and to be inspired by others. We will all get to know them both during the conference and at the award ceremony tomorrow evening. I am particularly happy to announce an exciting initiative, the Zero Project Impact Transfer. Actually, this is our third gift of our two anniversaries. Together with Ashoka, we have established a strategic alliance and designed a pilot program based on existing scaling models developed by Ashoka. We identified together 10 social innovators from out of the 68 innovative practices selected in this year's research. Ashoka, its mentor network, and some financial partners are now supporting these innovators to create self-sustaining models to be grown, scaled up, and replicated outside the countries in which they currently work highly successful. I'm so grateful that the founder of Ashoka, Bill Drayton, has sent us the following video message. From Ashoka, everyone a change maker. First, immediately, let me thank everyone who's at the Zero Project Conference. You are representing half of humankind when you add families who are very directly affected to the 10% with disability. And it's not just health, it's human rights, it's dignity. It's the right to pers the pursuit of happiness. It's so important. Thank you. And I think I speak for all of us in thanking Mart Martin Nessel. He's a very close friend. He's built a major part of Ashoka, the globalizer. We're working together to bring some of the world's most strong social entrepreneurs for disability to work together, think together, to add an element of, a further element of strength to the movement. Martin means big strategy and action. Now, we live at a moment in time that represents a huge opportunity and risk for the movement. 
It's just a fact that the rate of change has been escalating exponentially since 1700. And the same is true for the degree of interconnectedness. And the demand for repetition is a mirror curve going down. Those are just facts. The old system, you learn a skill, barber, banker, you repeat it for life in a workplace with walls is dying. In its stead, you have an everything changing and therefore of necessity and everyone a change maker world. Now this is the challenge for everyone here. If we can help make sure that those who are differently abled are change makers, they will fly because there is tremendous unmet demand for people with those skills. That's an opportunity to escape the disability. And I, I mean, not just physical or mental disability, but everyone who is in a disadvantaged group. Unfortunately, there is a risk in the other direction. To the degree that anyone that we are serving does not learn the skills and does not become a change maker, their situation is going to get much worse very fast. When you get to a turning point like this, if you see it and you move on it, that's the best. If you miss it, you're in big trouble. So this is the new inequality. Are you in the world of being able to contribute to change or not? And the world is now being divided between those who have this gift and those who are being pushed down. We don't need you, go away. And your kids don't have a future. We've got to make sure that everybody is in the game. And that's an added dimension of challenge and opportunity for everyone here. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, and thank you to the whole uh, Ashoka team for the wonderful start of the cooperation uh, together with Zero Project. We are very proud together to design the uh, Zero Project impact transfer. Uh, you will get more information during this conference. Dear colleagues, I also have a very personal vision inspired by my friendship with Bill Drayton. If each of us finds and implement just one single innovation from this conference right now, in our home country, it would be like a wing beat of a butterfly, which can lead to a major shift in society for a better world for persons with disabilities. Thank you. Caroline. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm actually an Ashoka Fellow, so to see the collaboration between Zero and Ashoka is absolutely fantastic. And we have 10 um, colleagues here today who are going through that Ashoka Impact Zero Project program to look at scaling those innovations for greater impact. And once again, joining the dots means greater influence and change. So it's a really, really, really exciting collaboration. Um, a few of you have been asking about this red line here um, on the ground. For those of you who know me, I have a tendency to run up and down the aisle. This is to stop me going over the line, okay? Though this is a world without barriers, this barrier is for me only, okay? So don't worry about it. It's just to make sure I don't run up and down. Um, I might do later, but not now. Um, the other thing that's really important about what Martin says, and I just want you to understand the importance of tomorrow's unveiling of this accessible piece of art that is in the rotunda in the UN. It is very, very unusual 
such a gift would be accepted into the UN. And I think that's a huge credit, actually, to you, Martin, but also to the relationship that we have very strongly held with the UN over the last five years. And a huge part of that is it is wonderful, as always, to welcome, I think, our long-term friend and co-green wearer, Ambassador Christine Stick-Hackel, who has been with us from the very, very beginning. And it is such a pleasure to have you always here. It would not be the same without you. So please, you are very, very welcome. Uh, thank you very, very much, Caroline, for this nice entry uh, you gave me. Um, it's right, we have been here uh, for all the five uh, conferences, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here for this fifth and jubilee time. Dear Mr. Essel, Royal Highness, uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It, besides being a big pleasure and honor to personally welcome you here for the fifth time in the Vienna International Center for the annual Zero Project Conference, I just want to underline that what better venue could be chosen for this conference than a headquarter of the United Nations, the organization that adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities 12 years ago. The Austrian permanent mission to the UN in Vienna would like to take this opportunity also to express its most sincere thanks to the United Nations Office Vienna for not only offering its premise to the Zero Project Conference for the fifth time, but also for its continued support in this endeavor. As we have heard, the aim of the Zero Project is to support the implementation of the Convention of the UN on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Although this UN Convention has now been ratified by 175 nations, there is still work to be done to bring these provisions into action. This conference provides an excellent opportunity to step up our efforts to realize the objectives of the Convention. Austria is known for its long-standing engagement in human rights issues, especially taking into account the right of all vulnerable groups in our society, among which are women, children, and persons with disabilities. Consequently, Austria has not only ratified all the relevant UN conventions, but is also actively advocating for their implementation. Last year alone, Austria actively participated in an OECE side event held in Warsaw, which focused on the participation of persons with disabilities in political and public life. At the Conference of State Parties to the UN Convention in New York, Austria strongly emphasized the importance of accessibility and participation of persons with disabilities. In January last year, the Austrian guardianship law has been completely reformed, focusing on the autonomy of the persons concerned. From the beginning of this process, disabled persons organizations and the self-advocacy community have been actively involved. One crucial question in this context was, what conditions do we need in order to enable persons with disabilities to participate and to be fully included in society? One of the core elements certainly is accessibility. Without barrier-free access to the physical environment, our everyday surroundings, as well as the information and the internet, 
participation cannot take place. I am therefore very pleased at that the topic of this year's conference is accessibility. As this is my fifth year at the conference, I could personally, as it was already mentioned by Mr. Essel, witness the growing success. With, as we have heard, more than 500 participants from more than 70 countries, this conference has become a catalyst for building bridges and breaking down barriers to ensure equal opportunities. By bringing together innovative people, decision makers, and opinion leaders from all parts of society, and creating an as inspiring atmosphere where best practices are discussed and shared, this conference is a firm step towards a future accessible for everyone. The permanent mission of Austria is therefore very pleased to have the opportunity to continue to support this remarkable initiative of the Austrian Essel Foundation. I would like to conclude by again congratulating the organizers for their great work in bringing us together to find ways to reach the goals of the UN Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities. I would like to thank all of you as well for your dedication and conviction. And I wish you every success in creating a more inclusive and accessible society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. It's, it's just so great to have you. And can I just say, I appreciate that she's wearing brand colors for Zero Like Me. Every year you do it, every year, commitment. So listen, I have a bit of news. Um, I did say to you that we have reached capacity here. So I think there might be some people down the back. I can't see you, but there are a few seats up here in the front if you'd like to. Also, for anybody who does not get into this room, we are live streaming, and you can see it downstairs if you can't get into the room or have a seat here. And also, you can watch it on our website, okay? This year, because we are trying to make sure that we reach as many people as possible because this room only has a certain capacity, in each of our breakout rooms, we will be recording. This room, as you know, as usual, is live streamed. And as, as I said, you can watch it downstairs. But we are really trying to reach out to our social media channels. So our hashtag is hashtag zero con 18. We give you full permission to take out your cell phones and mobile phones and tweet, Instagram, Facebook, and use our app. So we are giving you permission. Go for it. Let's get this conversation outside this room and connect all the dots. So anybody who is at the back, please, there are a few, very few, but there are a few seats up here at the front. Now, as always, we are made incredibly welcome by the wonderful country of Austria. And today, to welcome us officially from the Ministry of Social Affairs, I would really like to welcome Max Rubisch. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Madam Ambassador, dear Mr. Essel, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to give you a welcome on behalf of the Federal Minister of Labor, Social Affairs, Health and Consumer Protection, Beate Hartinger-Klein. The Zero Project Conference has become a recognized event which brings together people from all over the world every year. Many thanks to the United Nations for hosting this conference in the Vienna International Center. The main theme of this conference, accessibility, is important for all people, but most of all, it is important for people with disabilities. In the different contexts of life, barriers hinder the participation of people with disabilities in society. Accessibility could seen 
as the key to inclusion. That brings me to the UN Convention, the CRPD. It gave a very strong impact on Austria's disability policy. Ten years ago, in 2008, Austria has ratified the CRPD and since then Austria has made a lot of efforts to promote the concept of inclusion and the concept of accessibility. As many of you know, in 2012, the Austrian federal government adopted a national action plan on disability for the period until 2020. The plan covers all areas of life and contains 250 measures. Until now, almost two-thirds of these measures are implemented or are on a successful way. I want to highlight four points. First, uh, as Madam Ambassador mentioned before, Austria has completely reformed the Austrian guardianship law in line with the principles of Article 12 of the Convention, focusing on the autonomy of the persons concerned. The second Adults Protection Act fundamentally changed the existing guardianship law. A modern law on supported decision-making was adopted, which shall guarantee the right for people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities to decide by their own. In a process of participation, disabled persons' organizations and the self-advocacy community have been part of the working groups preparing this reform. My second point, in oct last October, all parliamentary parties voted for a so-called inclusion law package. That means, on the one hand, the protection against discrimination in the disability equality law was improved. On the other hand, the financial means in the disability employment law that are needed to promote employment are increased. The law guarantees also the political and financial independence of the Federal Monitoring Committee in line with the Paris principles and foresees a yearly amount of 320,000 euros to finance the work of this monitoring committee. To improve data and statistics, the Austrian Statistical Office is allowed by law to use and connect existing administrative data on disability while guaranteeing full data protection. Third point, employment. People with disabilities are more likely to be unemployed for longer periods than those without disabilities. So it is necessary to support the employment of this group. In 2017, an average of 70,000 people with health-related placement problems were registered at the public employment service. Among this group, 13,000 were handicapped in the narrower sense, which means, which means that have a preferential treatment according to the Disability Employment Act. In 2017, around 195 million euros from the federal budget, the European Social Fund and the Compensatory Tax, tax Fund were used to finance disability employment projects and individual support. More than 100,000 persons with disabilities were supported by these measures in gaining or in securing their jobs. Also for employment, accessibility is crucial. Since uh, this January, we have a special support for companies with the new action, barrier-free companies. If the conditions are fulfilled, companies will receive a one-time subsidy on an investment that contributes to the accessibility of the enterprise. On my last point, I come to the European Union level. Austria supports the proposal for a European Accessibility Act to ensure the accessibility of essential goods and services in the single market. It will contribute to the inclusion of persons with disabilities in society and to the implementation of the CRPD on European level. We hope that the trilogue negotiations between the Council, the European Parliament and the European Commission 
that are starting now will end positively this year. Ladies and gentlemen, since last December, Austria has a new federal government. The government's program 2017 to 2022 uh, also reflects on people with disabilities. The legal system will be further adapted to the provisions of the CRPD, and the government will launch comprehensive information campaigns on the content of the CRPD. It is planned to evalu evaluate and renew the national action plan. A new action plan will be drafted for the period 21 to 30, and this will be done in a process of participation. The new plan will take up the results of the evaluation and will use the expertise from the disability community. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish all of you a successful and inspiring conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Max. I um, really appreciate it and thank you for your welcome to this fabulous city and country again. Um, one of the characteristics of this conference for all of you that have been here many times and for those of you who have just walked through the door, we have a great capacity to attract very committed and loyal friends who combine head and heart for impact. And I think having people come back to address this conference again is a great example. And we are delighted for our keynote speech this morning to open our conference. I think this is your third time back, is this right? Please, a huge round of applause for Daniela Bass. For those of you who can see me, now you see me, now you don't see me. So, good, after, good, good morning. Actually, it's afternoon for me because of the change of time coming from New York. Um, I wish to thank uh, and give my greetings to Your Excellency, Mr. Palinga, and uh, to uh, Your Royalty Highness present here, and Mr. Martin Essel, and the Ambassador Christine Stieke Hackel, as well as to the experts and colleagues and friends uh, from the uh, global community. No. Yes. Um, indeed, I, I was listening to you, so I would like to say something before um, um, three points I would like to share with you. Um, I was listening to you and how relevant the uh, CRPD, the, Conf the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, has been so far, and uh, how important are human rights Indeed, these are key tools um, to, to promote different aspects of development. And my, my sharing with you some knowledge today will be more focused on development. Uh, the department I work for, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations in Vienna, and the division I lead, the Division for Social Policy and Development, deals with uh, promoting and developing uh, strong policies that should be then implemented at a national level for human rights and uh, any rights, including CRPD, to be implemented. We need uh, policies if we want any kind of rights to be implemented. So this is what I'm going to share with you today. And this is the efforts and the endeavors we're doing in New York. Mm, I would like also to say that um, um, besides the Conference of the State Parties, which has played and still plays an amazing role uh, in making life of persons with disabilities and not in general community, because we're talking more and more about mainstreaming and less and less about highlighting the this and more highlighting the ability. This can stay at home. So let's try to bring here the abilities uh, more and more and definitely uh, with the new tools that we do have. And one of these is called the 2030 Agenda 
of the United Nations with its 17 goals. And for those who can see, I'm wearing here a brochure with the 17 colors of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And those who can't, now I described you what I'm wearing on my jacket. Um, well, these goals, 17, are amazing because this agenda with these goals to be reached by the year 2030 um, requires to be universal. It applies to all countries, developed or developing, and asks member states to be accountable. 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 And every year, member states have to report about the implementation of these 17 goals. And definitely, disability is mentioned very clearly in few of these goals and the targets. This is a very amazing step. So we do, and we also have other tools, such as the Addis Ababa agenda that deals with the finance, financial inclusion. So financing is also key for the topic we ha are addressing today, that is accessibility, which is not only eliminating architectural barriers, accessibility is much more. Um, I, I would like to share with you, as I said, three points, which is the new brand of the division I lead, looking forward. So we thought about triple I. One eye, two eyes, three eyes, that is wisdom, if you think of uh, the um, uh, Oriental philosophies. But actually, these are three eyes, or the um, triple I, is I like inclusion. I like inequalities, in parentheses, reduction of inequalities. And the third I, which is the most important and powerful, is impact. And I do think that with, that with the Zero Project, what we're aiming is definitely to have impact. And then I will conclude with a way forward. So when it comes to um, um, impact, yes. The division I lead supports governments and gives advice and share information in order to strengthen, as you, as you might see on the slide I'm showing right now, um, international cooperation for social development, inequalities, poverty eradication, productive employment and decent work, and social inclusion of many groups, older persons, young people, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and persons marginalized from society and development. These are the areas we deal with for the whole United Nations system globally. So it's, it's a big challenge we have ahead of us. And I'm, I'm so glad to be here to share with you this challenge and then you can be ambassadors once you go back home and become yourselves uh, multipliers. So instead of a triple I, it would be great to have a billion I's, etc., etc. The more the merrier. As I said, um, when it comes to accessibility, it, it means that we, if we do have access to health, if we do have access to schools, if we do have access to employment, but also access to change prejudices and change behaviors. There are many, many kinds of access. Um, access to transportation, access to fun and leisure and laughter and happiness and well-being in general. We do have inclusion. At that point, we can really talk about being included. And as director of the Division for Social Policy and Development, definitely this is one of my goals. Also personally, I have to say, uh, having a disability myself. So social inclusion means uh, that all persons with these or abilities or disabilities can participate equally in the society without discrimination or barriers. And for example, participating in schools as equal as peers, uh, easy access to health services, equal opportunities to employment, as we said earlier on, are fundamental if we want to talk about inclusion. But inclusion is not only that. 
inclusion of the needs, of the concerns, of the perspectives, of the dreams and wishes of all people, in particular those marginalized groups in society, uh, well, all of this has to be there in the concept of inclusion. It's, again, not just physical. It's not just eliminating barriers, physical barriers. It's much more, and this applies to everybody. Needs, wishes, hopes, aspirations. It applies to everybody. It's an equalizer. So, accessibility has been defined as the provision of flexible facilities and environments, either virtual or physical, to accommodate each user's needs and preferences. And this definition comes from the Copenhagen Summit of 1995, which was and still is the only global conference that took place to discuss social development issues. Accessibility is a precondition and an enabler to achieve social inclusion. And, uh, and uh, we do know, though, that there is a still quite a bit to be done when it comes to accessibility. And, uh, and we are still seeing in many parts of the world the uh, negative impact of areas and places that are not accessible, including um, perceptions and stereotypes that build barriers. So let's move now to the second I, that is reducing inequalities. So accessibility, I heard this from the previous speakers, I was so glad because you all used the words equalizer, impact, integration, participation, I said yes, bingo. We are right there, already really to keep moving forward. It took a few years, but we are all on board now and I can feel it and it's amazing. So allow me um, to share with you a little bit more about the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and as uh, the, the presenter said earlier on, to leave no one behind. And when we say no one behind, we mean also the private sector, not just people. I want to extend it to everybody who is engaged in making a better world. Because if we do have this equalizer, then definitely, automatically, we reduce inequalities. And uh, equal access to social welfare, education, employment, and, you know, are fundamental for the empowerment of persons with disabilities. And next year, in New York, at the United Nations in New York, the ECOSOC, which is a mechanism of the United Nations, and the High Level Political Forum, another mechanism of the United Nations in New York, um, will be focusing on empowerment. 2019 is going to be devoted to empowerment. This year is resilience. Next year is empowerment. So I'm already sharing this with you in order to um, get ready to um, better make sure that um, um, we organize ourselves so that persons with disabilities can participate in decision making and leadership, leadership in society and in development, not just beneficiaries, leaders. Impact. Well, we said that um, impact comes without saying, if we talk about social inclusion and then we talk about reducing inequalities, there is an impact. Now, what kind of impact am I talking about here? Well, so, when it comes to policy frameworks, as I mentioned earlier on, developing strong policy frameworks to be implemented at national level and the norms that are required, then we do have an impact on accessibility because in this way, we make sure that accessibility, whatever kind of accessibility we're talking about, is sustainable, keeps reproducing itself. And, um, and uh, we do know that the Sustainable Development Goals uh, uh, constitute an unprecedented global agreement to build a future that is sustainable and really inclusive of all. Um, I would like also to say that um, the, the 
frustration that still exists is there. I mean, we cannot deny that the world is not perfect yet. Maybe it will never be. But you know, one of the things that one of the first secretary general, generals of the United Nations used to say, the UN cannot bring and build paradise. What the UN can do is to avoid hell, which is amazing if you think of that. Amazing. So let's, let's keep trying to avoid as much hell as we can and as much inclusion as we can. So um, I have a question for all you experts. Why we have this huge gap still existing and how we can narrow the gap even when it comes to accessibility? It's a question. And I ask everybody of you here this question ministers, mayors, city planners, business investors, and all of us in our capacities as residents, customers, and also you know, whatever uh, products we, we have and we place on the market. So why not all products, et cetera, et cetera, and places are accessible? How can we raise awareness followed up by concrete actions. And I would like to highlight there the word concrete actions, inviting everybody to better participate and capture the benefits and impact, positive impact of accessibility. Accessibility is clear that uh, for its own good deserves a greater attention in the agendas and in the efforts concerning urban and rural development as well. The world is going to be completely different in the next 20, 30 years. The majority of the population of the world will be living 60% and more in urban areas, not in rural areas. So we have to make sure that our planners think of the world differently to make sure that both those who live in cities and rural areas benefit of accessibility in all its ways not only for persons with disabilities, but I think also of youth. Those living in rural areas need the roads, need to have the means also to, 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 to support themselves financially, to go to cities, to work, etc., or to decide to stay in rural areas, but making them so attractive that rural areas are not going to be abandoned. Who is going to provide us the food otherwise? Sorry, this is another topic, but uh, it, it's very important. So when we're planning, we really have to plan for everybody. And I go back to the concept of mainstreaming. I'm not only talking about disability and persons with disabilities here. I'm talking about people. That's mainstreaming. That's our concern. And uh, so um, an inclusive approach is very important. We do have tools such as universal design, and actually UN DESA published a resource on good practices of promoting accessible urban development with the support of the Zero Project, by the way. Applause, applause. So, I'm almost at the end. So what could be the, the way forward? Mm, as I said, accessibility deserves greater attention in the international agendas. It is important to have inclusive approaches following the philosophy of universal design. Building and strengthening multi-stakeholder partnerships and global knowledge base are vital in finding innovative solutions. And we develop innovative solutions, we develop technology. So I go back to development. Rights are so important, but for them to become a reality and be implemented, we have to develop policies and norms and develop many other things to make our lives um, accessible and, and pleasant to live. So there is no real formula but the one of working together. And that's goal 17 of the 2030 Agenda, partnerships. And that's what I'm seeing here. And this is what's happening year by year, after year after year. More and more partnerships are created thanks to the initiative of the Zero Project. My congratulations. And uh, 
and I just want to thank you a lot again. And I'm really, really inviting policymakers to take advantage of this amazing opportunity offered by the Zero Project and to have a dialogue with uh, all representatives here of civil societies, enterprises, etc., to strengthen this Goal 17 partnerships, Goal 10 inequalities, reduction of inequalities, Goal 8 employment, Goal 3 health, Goal 4 education, Goal 1, which is the overarching theme of the whole United Nations 2030 agenda, reducing poverty. If we make sure that places are accessible, that people are included, and what we do has an impact, we reduce definitely poverty and we reach the goal. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Daniela, um, for your passion, your leadership, your commitment for coming back. Um, I want to take you up on your challenge. So Daniela has asked us to answer the question about why the accessibility gap still exists. So can you please take to social media and give your opinion? It'd be really worth us trying to, as we come to the end of the conference, just see what you're all saying. Um, also, Daniela, it's so great to hear you talk about dreams and laughter and fun, because that is also so much part of an inclusive life. And I think from my perspective, because I have to answer this if I have a microphone, one of the reasons that I think the accessibility gap still continues to exist is the lack of critical global business leadership to stand with us and for us. And I really, really push those buttons on that. And for me, we need to have an accessibility attitude. So I just want to say a huge thank you to Daniela. And I want to, this is the sort of conclusion of our opening ceremony. So can you please give a massive round of applause to Martin, to Madam Ambassador, to Max, and to Daniela. We love them. What a great opening. Now, you are very welcome to leave the stage um, because we're going to talk about a few housekeeping rules. So. Michael Fenbeck, come up here. Now, we all know Michael Fenbeck. Could we please give Michael Fenbeck a hand of applause here? So, Michael and I are going to do a bit of a Bonnie and Clyde on uh, some of the complexities of this conference because we have a few changes. So, we're going to run through them. So, this is the part you need to be really attention focused. So, Michael, I'm going to run through some of the, the, some of the changes that we have. Now, Around accessibility itself, we've just talked about it. So, how is Zero providing accessibility for us? Well, we, we did a we did a counting, and we came up to, to 23 uh, accessi accessibility measures that we uh, took to make this conference even more accessible. There's no fully accessible conference, but we we tried in 23 different ways to make it more accessible. We also prepared a paper for everyone who's interested in conference planning. So there's a, there's a sheet out there, happy to provide you with, a, with, with, a, with this paper. Now videos, um, a lot of people are very interested in seeing the content that we provide in Zero. So how can the delegates get the content? We, um, we, we did a lot of things of making the content more accessible. Um, there was Marina from our team who worked hard with all the presenters so uh, they uh, make their presentations fully accessible, shorten them, get the message through. So accessibility is also uh, making the information accessible, accessible. And we did one really special um, uh, feature. Klaus Höckner is sitting there in eighth row. Um, eighth row? He, eighth row, okay. there, that's him. Uh, Klaus, he... Um, what he did was an amazing job. We, we sent him all the 80-something presentations that we had in PowerPoint, and he recorded all of, the, of them on video. And the good thing of, uh, you're probably asking why on video, what's, what's the difference? No. The dif the, you don't ask me? No, I okay. think you're great. Keep going. Okay. Um, See, we make a great team, don't we? Yeah. I'm better looking, though. So if you ask me, I would say uh, the good thing about this, it, it's on video, it's more accessible, it, it's, uh, it has subtitles and captioning, and it, it's all on YouTube, and you can use the full YouTube functionality on those subtitles, meaning you, you can read this in, in 45 different languages that uh, YouTube offers. So, so should we give a round of applause to Klaus, I think? I wow. think it needs... Co thank you very much, Klaus. Can you stand up there first? 
Yeah, that's a big step forward. Yeah. It's not, not, up, not everything's uploaded, but at the end of the conference, we'll have all of them uploaded also to be used, of course, after the conference. Okay. Um, I've mentioned the app already. For those of you who've not downloaded the app, if you want to use it, please do so because you have obviously our whole content and the, the ability to connect with other delegates. Anything else we need to know about the app? I mean, it's even better than it was last year. It's even better, and there's also a chance to uh, to connect with uh, with, with uh, directly with Twitter. So everything that you post on the on the app, you can post at the same time at Twitter. So you don't have to do it twice. And uh, I think if you check the app, we added some features. I think it's uh, it's a nice a nice tool. I mean, we're really committed to doing a lot more social media this year, right? And I think particularly after the award ceremony, each of the awardees are going to do a small video for social media. Um, Martin, where are you? Um, if you see our social media guru whizzing around. Oh, I can't see him because I can't see very well. I think he's well. preparing something oh, he's right probably now. Yeah. Anyway, so Martin wants you. He is lit. If you see Martin, he would love to have conversations with you. We have Instagram this year as well. So Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So please, please, please tweet. And once again, our hashtag is ZeroCon18. Yeah. Anything else we need to know? Yeah, we have the, the team from Zeit Echt. Uh, they, have, uh, they will prepare... Uh, with all the awardees of tomorrow evening, they will prepare videos, one-minute videos to be used immediately after the, after the award ceremony. So every awardee will have their own one-minute video to be, we, we put this on, on Facebook, to be hopefully shared immediately on, on, on Twitter and Facebook. So you have your own small video uh, you can use and will hopefully use for your purposes. So for all of you 80 awardees, be prepared for your one minute and look your best. Uh, graphic facilitation, what is all this about? Well, we have, we have Petra, uh, Petra Blitzka, who uh, uh, joined us three or four years ago. Yeah. And she will be in many sessions, in many parallel sessions, and she will do the, the graphics. She will draw and, and, and uh, tell her story in, in, in a graphic way, and she will summarize it in her words at the end of this session. So we also provide graphic facilitation, not in all the sessions, but she's there the full three days. And she's amazing. And these are really, really worth you taking a photograph of. They're fantastic. I've mentioned our sign languaging crew over here, as you've, uh, I introduced them earlier on. Um, I know I speak very fast, so I'm a hypocrite to say this, but we should all remember to try and speak a little slower. And also, not everybody's first language is English, so we should remember that too. I will remind myself of that again. Um, parallel sessions. So this year we only have three parallel sessions, right? So can you want to explain to everybody? Yeah, so right after this couch discussion, we spread out into, into the three rooms. So, uh, one of the sessions is always in M1. This is M1. M2 is the room next door. That's this, this, the oval style. And there's also M3. M3 is, a, you have to go right there on, 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 across three corners. Um, you this look is, like an air hostess doing that. Yeah, that, that's yeah. M3. <laughs> okay. um, M1 and M M3 are uh, based on, on solutions, so most of, of, um, of the presentations are on innovative practices and policies. M2 is more on, on, on forums of policy makers, so we're happy that uh, several UN agencies joined us. Um, it's ILO, it's WHO, um, it's ITU, and it's also Gates and, and G3ICT. They were uh, so we're really glad that they joined us. We, we created joint forums where policymakers uh, discuss uh, current issues and all related to, to accessibility. So th for you to know, once we finish the couch session here, we're going to break into those three rooms from midday until four o'clock. And there are several sessions in those rooms. And f feel free to go in between, right? That's what sure. we want. Yep. You to, to go in and out of those rooms at your own leisure because not everything runs concurrently. There's no lunch break, so no other break. So you just move and go to whatever session you, you yeah, want. Okay, but you are allowed to get your sandwiches, right? You, know, you don't say your sandwiches, no food, but not in the lunch break because there is none. Okay, but they're allowed to bring their sandwiches into the room, right? Not in the room. No. Okay, well, this is important information. Nobody's yeah. allowed to bring food into the room. No, no food in the room. Okay, that's a new piece of information. You have to eat a sandwich in the corridor, okay? So, just so you know that. Um, okay, tell us a little bit about the trail, because we have the accessibility trail this evening, straight after the keynotes. Tell us a little bit about that. So, uh, Michal and her team from Accessible will, will tell you a lot more at the end of, um, of, the, of the sessions here in the, in the afternoon. They have done an amazing job of preparing 15 innovative practices so that they are jointly with them able to present this in a, in a very em empathic way. Uh, you can try, you can experience, uh, and you should use the time, 
the trail is open for three hours jointly to, 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 to the dinner. And please use this opportunity to, um, to, uh, to, to go through the trail. And, yeah, no, it's brilliant. And, and that the whole team of XSC really has done an amazing job, job, I promise you. Yeah, these guys are amazing. Now back to food again, just to let you know, remind you about your vouchers per day, your sandwiches at half 11, eat them in the corridor. Dinner will be tonight around 5.30 and it will also be tomorrow here after the award ceremony, so you know that. Now, last but not least, our famous exhibition. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? If, um, the, uh, we, we ask um, 30 uh, innovative solutions and their organizations behind uh, to come and bring uh, presentation material, um, uh, apps, and uh, to showcase what they have. So up to 30 are now outside the room preparing their stuff and also starting from five o'clock. It's, it's only exhibition, it's only trail. There's nothing going on in the room, so please use, use this opportunity to connect with the exhibitors. They're all here for the three conference days, but to, tonight between five and eight, that, that's their time. That's show time for exhibition. Yeah, and as I said at the very beginning, this conference is about connection. Connection, 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 talking to people, finding somebody you've never spoken to before. And honestly, that is where our magic and our community has happened. So that kind of rounds up our housekeeping. Is any, if you've got any questions, just come up to any of us. Generally, we're wearing a green tie or some form of green outfit. So come up to us and ask us anything. We're only here to help. And to finish off the morning session, Michael is going to take to the couch like a TV presenter and bring his panelists to talk about high-tech solutions. So right. over to you, Bonnie. Yeah. Thank you, Clyde. Um, just one information, I have a red point here on my name tag. This uh, is for Zero Project team members, so you can approach any Zero Project team member with in any time with any questions you have. So may I ask uh, forward David, Christopher and Rodrigo to me here on the couch. David. Welcome, Christopher. Take this one. We, we let uh, Rodrigo sit here. Yeah? I think oh, this is the best place. Or this one? I think it's better. Yeah. So, normally at this stage of the Zero Project Conference and at many other conferences, what you do as a conference organizer and programmer is to somehow level the playing field, open up the horizon, and explain what accessibility is about uh, so that we know what we talk about at this conference. Um, we did something different this time. Uh, we said, let's this time, with the topic of accessibility and the importance of technology, do it differently. Let's not open the horizon. Let's open the hearts. Let's open the mind. Let's encourage uh, the vision there is what technology especially might bring for the future. Um, with me here to discuss the topic of high-tech solutions are three distinguished experts, and I'm really happy that they are here with us at the Zero Project Conference and join me here on the couch. Um, it's Christopher Lee, it's David Baines, and it's Rodrigo Hübner mendes Give them a, a, a brief applause for the beginning. I think they deserve it already now, and thank you for coming here. We will start with a brief introduction of my uh, three colleagues here on stage, and then we move into explaining very different technologies uh, that we have jointly decided that they are not already there on the market, but they might and most probably will influence uh, the way accessibility is seen and the way we all can access uh, the world differently in three, five years, hopefully. So. Christopher, let's start with you. Give us a brief intro. Tell us, tell us who you are. Okay, my name is Christopher Lee, and it is great to be here. This is my third Zero Project conference, and um, my background is in social psychology and assistive technology. I came from the University of Georgia as well as the Georgia Institute of Technology in the States, and I'm looking forward to um, to talking to you about high tech technology. Thank you, Christopher. David, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm David Baines. Um, my background and history was originally as a teacher uh, and then working to develop services in different parts of the world. So uh, I've had a lot of interest over the last few years, both in a replication and transfer of innovations uh, and developments across cultures and within cultures. I've also got a real interest in disruptive innovation. 
and how we as service delivery, as initiatives, respond to change in technology, but also in user behaviour in planning for the future. So one of my first things, picking up on uh, Daniela's point earlier, why, do we, why is the gap still there? Well, the gap keeps moving, because humans keep moving. Their behaviour keeps changing, and as such, we keep introducing new gaps. Thank you, David. Rodrigo, it's your turn. So thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, uh, I, was, I was born in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, and uh, during my childhood, I was passionate about soccer. I started playing at the backyard of my home, and as soon as I felt confident, I asked my father to subscribe me on a championship. And I remember the day when I was selected to the major team of my club. That was like a dream for a boy at that age. Jumping forward in time, after finishing high school, I was preparing myself to enter the medical school uh, when I passed through a car robbery. I was leaving my home when two armed uh, robbers approached me and, and shot me uh, through the neck. Uh, the consequence was the paralysis uh, below my shoulders, but luckily I had the best support someone can get from physicians, family and friends, and that allowed me to uh, finish my studies and I started my career as a business consultant at Accenture. Uh, so nowadays uh, I run an institute that is focused on guaranteeing that every child with disability has access to quality education in mainstream schools. And in that sense, we develop research about best practices around uh, the world. We promote teacher training uh, for professionals from 20 states in Brazil and during the last two years, I have been working for the government of Angola uh, in order to, to support them on the creation of a national policy uh, of inclusive education. So uh, I'm glad to share the panel uh, with David, Christopher, and being led by Michael. Uh -huh. um, thank you, Rodrigo. And now, um, I ask technology to, to show the video that Rodrigo has uh, prepared for us. I can promise it's a, it's a unique video because it shows Rodrigo's brain. He recorded this two, two days ago for us and Rodrigo, please tell us why we see your brain now. Yeah, Michael, is it possible to show uh, the, the Formula One video first? Actually, we have not prepared that. that, that that's too long. Eh? But uh, I think we come to the Formula One okay, after, after okay. you explained. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, uh, last year I received an invitation from Globo. Globo is the largest TV channel in Brazil. Uh, and they, they invited me to drive a Formula One car uh, using my mind. And uh, when I realized I was inside a race car and I'm using a helmet that was specially developed for me to, to command the car, the car with my mind. And uh, I remember the scene when the, the team leader came to me and, and asked me, Rodrigo, are you okay? Can we start? And, and suddenly it was, was me, the car, and the track. Uh, and this car had no pedals and no steering wheel. Uh, so I had to train for that. Uh, I used a, a brain uh, uh, computer interface. This, this image you are seeing is from my brain. Uh, here I have a device that ex uh, illustrates how it works. So it has uh, five uh, electrodes and those electrodes, they, they capture the electricity of my brain. Uh, and that allows uh, uh, me to uh, associate some uh, thoughts or some brain patterns with some commands. Uh, and we can train that uh, in, a, in a domestic way using this device. 
so that we can control those commands. In my case, the challenge was uh, to uh, trigger three, three commands to accelerate, to turn right, and to turn left. So at the beginning, uh, what, I, what I did was to, to think uh, about those, those three actions, but it did not work because uh, the computer was not distinguishing each command. Uh, coincidentally, I was reading a book about uh, universal design for learning, and, and the authors of the book, they explained that uh, when you use different human senses, uh, like vision, uh, uh, hearing and tasting, you activate different regions of your brain. Uh, so I tried to invest on that hypothesis, and after uh, some weeks of training, I could, I could control those, those three actions quite well. Uh, in order to accelerate, I thought that I was celebrating a soccer goal, so it refers to vision. In order to turn right, I thought that I was eating a delicious food, which refers to tasting. And in order to turn left, I thought that I was holding a bicycle handbar which is the touch, is something I, I still remember how, uh, how is the, was the feeling. Uh, and it worked, and it worked. Maybe we can, we can show this video later, uh, the Formula One car being driven by, by me. Uh, so uh, it was working on the computer. The question was if it would work on the car. Uh, and, and luckily it, it, uh, it was a... Uh, amazing experience to, to feel that I was driving a car again. It is curious because the last thing I did before uh, the quadriplegia uh, started was, was driving a car. And, and now, uh, 27 years later, I, I could uh, have this experience again thanks to this project created by, by TV Global. Thank you, Rodriguez. That's, uh, I think, an, an amazing insight what might be possible, hopefully, in the not so far future. Uh, may I ask technology to bring in the next uh, slide? Uh, this again, another um, uh, visualization of what brain computer interfaces means. And uh, Christopher and uh, David, may I ask you to come in and, and give your opinion, your thoughts, your expertise on if this is a technology that might pick up soon? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, you're talking about brain technology, but I'm actually, actually really fascinated with the, the way that AI is moving towards uh, developing autopilot call technology. And I don't know if you've been following what Tesla has been doing in the States, but the, the CEO of Tesla a couple of years ago set up a open AI facility for research and development. And from what you're hearing in the news, and it's all rumored and stuff, in 2019, Tesla's going to introduce their thinking AI software that will drive their, um, their actual software for their cars. Um, I'm just curious if you had followed that at all, because that's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Things are changing so fast. Uh, so this, this image that you are seeing, just to, to explain, uh, was, was the picture that I, I saw on the book that I was explaining. So it, it uh, shows how, how you, uh, you can explore different regions of your brain when, when you use different senses. But, but it's amazing, Christopher. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, unbelievable what, what is going on. Well, also, you think about brain um, imaging around people with cognitive disabilities and studying that area um, and seeing the different areas of the brain that actually are lit up when you have somebody who's dyslexia um, that can't read. Um, well, one person it lights up and the other person that has dyslexia it doesn't light up. So there's a lot going on in brain technology, and I commend you for the work that you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think the whole area of... Uh, using the ways in which we think to control is, is fascinating. We did, we did some work a few years ago 
uh, working with patients who were uh, well into conditions like motor neurone disease, ALS, and so on. And there was a big theory around at the time called death of self, which is when you could no longer communicate with the outside world, you hit a very rapid deterioration leading to your passing away. And one of the things that the BCIs gave us was the opportunity to give people very simple commands, yes and no, to link that to an AAC device to communicate. So by a simple thought process, active or inactive, people could be given back communication systems. If they could see, they could gather data in, they could control that environment through just a very single simple thought. That avoided this concept of death of self. It allowed people to interact until their bodies could no longer support them. Now that, for me, working with people at the greatest level of need, if technology can unlock at that level, the potential of technology for all is unbelievably significant. And, and with AAC devices nowadays, it's, it's the pricing's coming down. Unbelievably, so it's it's much more affordable. Yes, yeah. it's getting it out there. That brings us to the to the next um, the keyword that we noted down, and please also show the next slide. It's artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicle. That was the next topic that we agreed on, on to touch. I think Christoph, you already started it. Hmm? Yeah. So um, I was trying to think of an image to describe something which is actually really quite nebulous. Um, which is artificial intelligence. And I think that artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to bring about some of the most significant change in terms of access and accessibility uh, in the future. Uh, I'm getting a sort of slight reverb echo, which is interesting. Um, and what, what, does it, what does it allow us to do? Artificial intelligence and machine learning loves data. It loves lots and lots and lots of data. And it analyzes that data to predict, to anticipate, and to transform that data in new ways. And, and that transformation of data is really important. And we've seen that at some of its most basic levels in the fact that we can get tra text transformed into speech. We can get speech transformed into text. And traditionally, we saw how crowdsourcing allowed us to improve that. Google used to do this, this thing. I don't know if you all remember when you used to type into Google, you had to recognize and type words. And one of them was a really clear word, and one of them was a really unclear word. And the unclear word was being used by Google to improve the quality of its automatic uh, uh, character recognition, its, its text recognition. Every time you typed it in, you were adding to that. AI lets us take that much, much further if we've got those data sets. Um, and Microsoft have done some wonderful things. I can see Hector here. Um, so I'm really glad I'm speaking before Hector because I can talk about all the things he'll probably want to talk about later. So I get in first. So sorry, Hector. Um, really interesting putting together accessible PowerPoints. Because Microsoft are now utilizing AI to automatically tag the images and describe them. All I need to do is to check that those descriptions make sense. In Office 365, that's all we need to do. So it becomes easier. We transform the data and present it in new ways. And that gets to be really exciting. How many of you have tried out Microsoft's Seeing AI app? Oh, you have got to find this app. Uh, Hector didn't put his, his hand up, but I know he should be on that one as well. Seeing AI, so what it does, it looks at text, it looks at labels, it looks at people, takes an image and transforms that and describes that in text and then speaks it out. Now, this is really interesting. I could take an image of Chris, and seeing AI would describe who this person was. I don't know how you'd like to be described, Chris, but you will try it out. Now, it's not completely 100% accurate. Um, I was over uh, talking about it and demonstrating it a little while ago, and we tried it with uh, the, this, this woman who, uh, she was blind. She said, I would love to know, what does it say about me? 
So we held it up, we took her image, and it said, a woman looking happy, aged 63. She said, I'm 42! <laughs> Why has no one told me? So it's not entirely accurate yet. So there are lots of things where AI is beginning to enhance the way in which we interact with the world. Let's think about AI a little bit further. How can we use that purposefully? If we can predict behavior because we know what people do in certain situations, in certain interactions, we can use that, for instance, with people who use alternative and augmentative communication. If we go to a restaurant, we can say we recognize the location, we know that the last 10 times you went to this restaurant, you ordered these three foods. It's a pretty good chance you're going to order one of those three again. So let's call up the communication board that relates to this location. Predict your behavior and make that available to you. You can always switch off and use something else. It might be that you're going to meet somebody who you've met before. And your communication system knows when you meet Rodrigo or Chris, the last three times you met, you talked about these subjects. Let's predict that and give those as your first options. By predicting and anticipating behavior, we really start to speed up the communication process. But that's not the end. We can link that up mechanically into the concept of autonomous vehicles. And these were much easier to represent graphically. The idea that our vehicle, our car, fundamentally drives itself. And these have been tested with people with no sight driving around using an autonomous vehicle. Because what it does is it gathers data from sensors, from all of the vehicles and objects around you, for object avoidance. It then takes that a stage further and plans out your route and then drives you from A to B. So here's the thing, if we can do that with cars, we can apply exactly the same technology to our wheelchairs. Our mobility becomes much more possible, feasible, autonomous as a result of the technology. So AI, this thing you can't see, you can't touch it, has the potential for changing the lives of all people, including those with disabilities, in more ways than we can begin to imagine. Thank you, David. Christopher, you want to? Yes, I actually would just like to give an example because I get really excited actually when we talk about AI and machine learning. And um, David, what you, you talk about, um, I, I've seen actually hands-on with actually a, um, a professor at Georgia Tech that invented through AI machine learning the first robot teaching assistant. And this was done in 2016, 2017. So this is the computer science class, and this professor had his graduate students through, um, through using the IBM Watson platform develop a robot called Jill Watson. So Jill's idea was, the idea of Jill was that she would basically handle all the hundreds of forum questions that was coming in from students in this computer science AI class which is very interesting actually. And so as Jill was going through the class, the students had no idea that it was actually a robot that was actually answering the questions. And through machine learning, Jill got better and better. To the very end of the class, it was about 65% accuracy rate of actually answering those questions. And the students had no idea that this was actually going on. And um, when they found out, they were shocked. So what's happening right now is you're seeing AI and machine learning impacting classrooms um, behind the scenes without even people knowing about it. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Rodrigo? Yes, and, and uh, going back to the, my era, which is education, uh, it, it, is, it is amazing uh, the, the uh, alternative uh, we can offer to teachers in terms of planning classes, in terms of thinking about different strategic uh, uh, pedagogical uh, approaches so that everyone can really learn. Uh, but I think it's also important to remember that uh, the technology by itself w will not be enough. 
to, to promote an inclusive society. So uh, when we think about an inclusive school, uh, it's important to remember that the barriers are not only uh, on the architecture, on the transportation, or on the equipment. Uh, they are also on the attitudes of some teachers that still don't believe that everyone can learn. Uh, so I, I have been uh, talking about uh, the necessity uh, of thinking about uh, a collective overcome. So uh, if we really want to, to build uh, an inclusive uh, organization, an inclusive school, or an inclusive country, uh, we have to involve everyone. We have to be willing to observe our attitudes, to uh, recognize our mistakes, uh, and to change uh, the way we react. We act. And uh, using the Paralympics, for, for example, uh, as a metaphor, uh, in my opinion, it's useless to cheer, to feel moved or to feel inspired uh, if on the next day we continue to live our lives exactly the way we have always lived, without changing our point of view, uh, without changing our procedures, and, and without changing uh, the way we organize uh, our society. So technology has a lot to do. Technology has a lot to help, uh, but I think we will only win the game uh, if we think about this collective transformation and this process uh, involves everyone. We have another one on teaching classroom and technology. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a, when Michael asked us collectively what high-tech solutions that we wanted to talk about, um, drone technology jumped up to the top of the list for me. Um, there are so many exciting things going on with drone technology. Um, the research around it right now is around $7 billion a year is being put, on, put into drone technology. Um, it's being used in industry, in the private and public. Um, it's been using, from, from the industry standpoint, from a private standpoint, it's been used in construction sites to, to monitor and manage um, for safety. Um, it's been used in a public site from a standpoint of higher education. So in higher education, it's being used for um, city and planning schools. So students actually could actually, through their curriculum, develop communities using drone technology, which is pretty impressive. It's also being used in um, journalism schools. So instead of reporting about sp sport events, you know, just kind of flat, it's very much more dynamic because now they have audio feed, you know, the visual feed, they have pictures that they actually can incorporate into their assignments. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. It's also being used in research across the globe, globe technology, I mean drone technology. And it's, um, it's being done at George Mason University is one example. I've got a, a photo up there where it's an interdisciplinary program. It's funded by industry where they're looking at social justice cause by using drone technology. So it's all over the place right now. And it's, you know, people are skeptical a lot of times of drone because of the history and the branding of drones, ethically, the privacy of drones, drones participating in war, but that is shifting. And we're seeing that also in K-12 and the, and the schools and middle schools and, and high schools where actually drone technology is impacting and it's being disruptive in a sense, and students are loving it. Um, they, we see it happening with eye-hand coordination, working with students who struggle with eye-hand coordination. Actually using the drone and actually trying to fly it actually helps. Also in writing, in STEM, um, STEM we're actually seeing it. Um, professors are actually using drones to, to look at um, rate units and different pre-algebra um, calculations. Um, so it's very, very exciting what's going on, and even to this extent that drone technology is moving towards open source, real-time, 3D um, flying images, well, so you can tie that into Google Earth. So there's a lot of stuff that's actually happening, um, and it's very exciting. Thank you, Christopher. We got two more. One is looks at first sight as frightening as a classroom drone, but is much more into it, I'm sure. Next slide, please. 
Again, you, Christopher. Yeah, but this actually ties a little bit into what you were talking um, about earlier, David. And it's it's um, this whole natural um, user interface, or what they're called NUI, is becoming more and more exciting. And we see this in gaming, right? But it's again being used in education a lot more. So the technology is shifting from just the gaming world, but into the classrooms. And teachers are starting to take advantage of it. And it's been challenging for these teachers to learn this type of technology. But as you can see on the slide, there are different types of um, NUIs. There obviously is the gesture, the skeleton piece, which is really what gets people excited. It's actually that kinesthetic, that tactile movement aspects of it. And then we talked already about the brain connection piece, which is so crucial to this piece. And it's gonna, the, the research of that is actually growing more and more. And then obviously the voice, a piece of it is actually be able to communicate now with your environments becoming more, and then obviously the organic gestures. I think uh, natural user interfaces, this idea of the ways in which we choose to behavior can be used to control the environment, uh, are again a very, very strong way in which some of those gaps are going to be filled. Um, and it, it, it might be a, a good point then just to jump on to the, uh, the next one and smart homes. Because what this starts to do now is we start to look at how all of these elements, Rodrigo's interface, the drones, the artificial intelligence, start to get pulled together into something that is very concrete and which actually many of us are experiencing anyway. This concept of smart homes. Uh, and smart homes really allow us to link together through sensors and controls the environment in which we live. Um, so, we can use a natural interface such as our voice with something like Amazon Echo, where we say, Alexa, turn on the lights, and the lights get switched on. Alexa, turn down the temperature, it gets a little cooler. Alexa, switch on the kettle, and our kettle starts to boil. So we can use a natural interface to control the environment in which we live. And we're already starting to see more and more people with a disability using these types of technologies, whether it's through a touch device, uh, like a tablet, whether it's through their voice, or even whether it's through gestures and so on. When we combine these things together, we give people much greater autonomy in their own home. Some of the ways in which we've seen people using this, people with little or no vision can control their environment automatically. People with physical disabilities don't need to find switches. Now that's interesting, because we no longer need to adapt the physical environment by bringing switches lower. We offer a redundancy of input. So our concept of universal design is no longer about make it fit the person in a wheelchair, our concept of universal design is anybody with a voice, with gesture, with touch, can control this environment. That's an important step forward in universal design. When we take that further forward, and we go full circle on this discussion back to artificial intelligence, we can predict behavior. So we can predict you're five minutes away from home. Let's set your front door to latched. Let's turn your lights on. Let's bring the temperature up. Let's switch the kettle on. So when you come through your door, those things are already in place. If you don't want them, just swipe or speak to say, no, I want something else to happen. Prediction and anticipation allow us to do those things. But let's understand that further. That doesn't have to be our own home. That can be the classroom, as Chris and Rodrigo have said. It can be your workplace. If you want more inclusive hotel rooms, why not have a voice control in every room? The switches on the lights, the calls for assistance, and so on. Because these technologies are not expensive. When we talk about accessibility gaps, digital divides, often cost is the thing which we, we, comes to us. But these devices, these interfaces, are mainstream. There's something that anyone and everyone is likely to start to use in the future in their lives, whether directly at home, when they travel, and so on. And that brings down the cost markedly and makes them accessible for many. And when we start to link these concepts together, we can move from smart homes, we can link our smart home data to transport data. 
so that we get alerts and advice in our home to tell us that the bus will be available in 10 minutes. It's time to start moving. We can get that data fed to us uh, to tell us what the weather is like. It will take us longer to get to the bus stop to get to work. We can draw from those data sets to anticipate and predict and guide us as to what will work well. When we link those things together, we start to move from a smart home to a smart city. The data sets are combined, the interfaces are combined, and we end up with something which is a smart city. But smart cities are based on smart communities. So whilst I would accept totally that technology is not the only cause of societal change, smart cities are going to be based on smart communities. The inclusive technology we introduce is possibly the main way we may guarantee that in those smart communities are inclusive communities. And that is immensely powerful for the future. <clears throat> Thank you, David. We are already um, coming to the end of the session. So, um, Christopher, would you like to comment and also uh, give us some fine words from, from your side? Yeah, the, the, wow, there's so much to talk about when you talk about technology. Um, just to feed off of David just a little bit, because I have to use this time wisely, right, is this, this whole feedback, this data analysis piece of that, and, and actually in real time changing the environment to support people with disability is crucial. And we're seeing that in adaptive learning technologies out there right now, specifically in learning management systems, where you're actually having real-time data that's actually changing the actual curriculum, um, the preferences in regards to um, it does that needs to the font needs to be bigger, does it need to be highlighted? And this is all being done automatically with very interesting software that is out there right now. So we're going to see a big change, I think, in education in regards to this adaptive learning technology. Thank you, Christopher. And Rodrigo, you got the concluding words now. Okay. Uh, j just to, to reinforce this matter of cost, this, this device that I used uh, is affordable by less than $100. So a few years uh, ago, we uh, could only uh, get this kind of images of the brain in, in hospitals or in uh, uh, science labs, and, and now we can do that uh, at our homes, or as I did two days ago at my hotel room uh, when I recorded this, the, those images. Uh, and I'm much more important than talking about uh, the fun side of this, these things uh, is the importance of the autonomy that they can bring us. Uh, so, just to, to conclude, uh, uh, I, I would like to say thank you to Globo, to this TV channel that reaches 100 million uh, people per day uh, and who allowed me to have this, this great experience. And, and thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Let's see if we can plan to show the video of the car uh, during those, the next days. We will find a spot. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to me on stage. Give a warm applause to everyone. Yeah, a big round of applause. I mean, we could have sat here and listened to you guys for hours. So to Christopher, Rodrigo, and David, and Michael, that was amazing, but I think your point well made. Aside from the extraordinary technology developments, it's still about attitude, right? It's all about attitude. So attitude and technology together. So thank you so much, guys. Um, we are on time. We have done it. So you are now to go into your breakout rooms, M1, M2, and M3 from midday. And you're to be back here at 4.30, guys. We have three exceptional uh, keynotes. We have Shelley London from the Poses Foundation. We have Vict uh, Hector Minto, evangelist of Microsoft. And we have you love Wagner from Access yeah, Israel. They're going to be the bomb. So be back here at, at 4.30 and enjoy the rest of your day.